out. So I appreciate you guys being on today for the Wednesday team meeting. It is middle of March. So what we want to understand is, hey, time continues to go by. Whether we choose to do something or whether we choose to do nothing, time's going to still continue to click by. A lot of us, you know, are starting to create some opportunities for ourselves um, on an organizational as well as a personal level. So what we want to do is build on that, let it compound, and just understand that if we take care of what we need to take care of, concentrate on what we can control, things will take care of themselves. I put this in the Facebook group this past week, and I want to make sure that we understand that if we talked about this, now, when you ask for a referral, a couple things have to happen. Number one, value has to be presented from your side. And then number two, value has to be recognized from the other side. Once that's been accomplished, once that's been taken care of, uh, we can ask for referrals. You can see that if we've done our job and value has been presented and recognized, most people in the appropriate settings will give you referrals. The problem is nobody asks for them. So you can see 91% will get referrals if asked, only 11% will ask. We always talk about marketing and lead generation. One of the things that you do to shoot yourselves in the foot is not let that line continue off of a client uh, to you know their referrals. Some of the easiest opening conversations that you can have is, hey, Joe Smith asked me to give you a call. Betty Williams asked me to give you a call. That trust, rapport, credibility, that's all instantly built through the referral system. Last week, what we did is we finished up a multi-week series, uh, or we started a multi-week series on handling objections, and we finished a multi-week series on conversions. Since the beginning of the year, you know, we've talked about marketing, lead generation, uh, the conversion process through your stair steps, and now we're working on objections. So last week, we talked about game plan for handling objections, how to overcome sales objections, Number one reason businesses struggle, getting to the underlying cause of objection. Um, if you do not know the why, you can't continue, and less words is better in our communication. Now, there were a lot of, uh, there was a lot of language and verbiage on that meeting. So what we also did is we sent out the PDF. So you guys have that verbiage. Once again, a lot of times if you have like, even though we're a digital company, if you have a notebook beside you, a three ring binder, you got some stuff printed off, it can help you in those times when you're trying to you know, control, continue direct conversations. Remember all of this guys, if you look at us like as a mining operation, this whole side over here is nothing but dirt. Now, in our digital world, these are leads, but they can be anything from an unqualified lead to a very qualified lead. We don't know. Our front side, we're just bringing in raw data. And through the process of what we do, how we approach the marketplace, the conversations that we have, we start to either qualify or disqualify leads in the sales process, recruiting process, or on the disqualification, the nurturing sequence. So that's all we're doing. We're bringing in raw data. We're putting them in the appropriate slots. And once you understand that's the front end of the business model, you don't get all emotional about this and you become numb to the process knowing, just like what we just talked about, that you control or you concentrate on what you can control, the rest will take care of itself. Remember, as you're going through this and what we talked about since the beginning of the year with marketing, lead generation, and conversion, when you um, create a lead, you're going to take it through the process. And sometimes you get only a couple steps in. Uh, sometimes you go all the way and hit the target. What you're ultimately doing is just understanding that the lead process and the lead conversion process is just a stair step. And at each one of those stair steps, there's a conversion rate. And sometimes you can fix stuff within the process that has a big overhaul um, and positive impact on you know, what you're trying to do on the back end. So along those stair steps, steps one, two, three, four, five, the things that we can really do to improve this in terms of disqualifying and qualifying is actively listen. Don't just press pause on your ability to talk just to wait till it's your turn to talk again. Actively listen, ask clarifying questions about what you heard, you know, reverberate back what you heard to make sure you heard it correctly. Educate the prospect on what he or she needs. Remember, what we have to offer on the back end is a means to get them to an end. 
depending on what their end is, that's how you approach the marketplace and introduce based on their unique needs. Don't oversell or just try to close a deal or recruit a prospect. Have a mutual one-on-one conversation about you know if and how we can possibly help them and then clarify again to make sure you're understanding them correctly. So this is just at every step, these are some things that we have to do that will improve the pipeline process. Another thing that we can really make sure that we protect ourselves from ourselves is as we learn more about our business, we wanna tell more people about our business. The problem is too much information is gonna paralyze people. So what is too much uh, information? Well, it's answering unasked questions. If somebody doesn't ask you a question, don't give them the answer for it. It's just too much information. Answer directly what they're asking. Pitch in unwanted features or benefits. Misaligning your solution to the pain or the use call or use case and saying anything that creates unnecessary risk in the prospect's mind. Too much information is as bad as too little information. So what you want to do is you want to find the medium where you are directly answering and communicating with them based on what they want to know to make that buying decision. Also, remember, when you are talking to people, there is a difference between an objection and a negotiation. Understand at which point you are because you don't want to mess up and be on one side when you really should be on the other side. So an objection is early on in the process. That's addressing a prospect's concern based on your product or your service to create technical, organizational, and personal buy-in. That's leading them through the sales process to the buying decision. Now, the negotiation on the other side is really about working out the terms of the deal. Once the sale has been made and you reach a mutually beneficial arrangement where both parties feel they're gaining value. So if you're in the negotiation process, don't go back to handling objections and vice versa. Understand where you are and how to navigate through to the next step. Also remember, there's just a handful really of typical objections. And once you understand that they've come in a lot of different forms, but they're basically based on either, you know, a lack of a budget, lack of trust, lack of need, or lack of urgency. And once you understand these are the typical objections and how to either handle them or what we're going to be talking about preemptively overcoming those, it's a lot easier to maneuver through. Remember, we're all wired basically the same way. The psychological responses are going to be, you know, pretty typical for a sample size of the population. And then why do the buyers object? Well, it's typically some of the same objections we just talked about. Lack of knowledge, um, you know, a specific warranted concern. Basically, that's a buying question, guys. If they've got a, uh, one particular concern, you can address that. It usually frees them up. Um, hidden agenda, perception issue, or unclear communication. So there's some things that we can do on the front side to help alleviate some of this and preemptively overcome it or overcome it as it's happening, knowing what we need to say. So how to handle sales objections like a professional, whether we are selling a product or a service or recruiting a new partner, it's basically the same outlines, the same um, agenda, the same language and verbiage. So when you're handling sales objections, you need to, like we talked about, practice active listening. The more that you can listen in the conversation, the more you can take notes, and the more that you can zero in on a motivating factor or a pain point, the easier it's going to be for you to move that prospect to the next stage. Repeat back what you hear to make sure you understood it correctly and your perception of what you heard was correct. Validate your prospect's concerns. Don't just you know throw them to the side you know, validate, help them understand that's a valid concern. Ask follow-up questions. Leverage social proof. What have we been doing? How have we been helping other people similar to them in their situations? Set specific dates and times and follow-up. This is important. Not just random follow-ups, but hold people to a time and a day. And then you have to anticipate sales objections. After you've heard a number of them over and over and over again, you go into some of these meetings knowing, hey, this is probably going to come up. And then a lot of times you can reframe stuff. And this is one of the best tricks in sales and, and recruiting is to reframe what they've told you as an objection. So is the ob objection a problem? And can that be reframed as an opportunity? Is the problem a weakness that can be reframed as a strength? And is the objection poor timing that can be reframed as perfect timing? So sometimes you're mirroring back, hey, that's a valid concern. 
And sometimes you're mirroring back to um, cross reference that and put that in a new frame of mind or a new frame of reference. Welcome your client's objections. If there's no objections and there's silence on the other end and you can't really get any participation, that's a really bad sign. If your prospect is asking questions, voicing concerns, asking for clarification, that is a really good sign. All of this stuff, remember, is just buying questions if handled correctly, just all part of the process. One of the things that you have to make sure that you understand and take into the process is, are we done addressing the concern? Because if we're not, and it's still, there's part of it that's still unaddressed, well, then we aren't able to really move to the next objection or to the next point. So what part of your concern do you feel is still left unaddressed? This is very important because like I said, if somebody's got five objections and you work through those until there's no longer any objections, well, guess what? There's no reason not to move forward at that point. You have to pick them off one by one, but make sure they're fully addressed before you move on to the next one. The last thing that you want to get to is the end point where you think everything's ready to move to the next step, whether that's you know, uh, you know, purchasing a product or service, whether that's coming on board as a partner. You want your clients and partners at that point to feel good, um, confident in their decision versus you know, handing over and onboard an agent enrollment, handing over a contract to sign, and there we're right back at point A. We're going back to the, uh, you know, the objections, the concerns, the clarification. When you get to the end point, you should be at the end point. Shouldn't go backwards. A lot of times you get to the end point and you're in the wrong position because you're trying to put people in the wrong place. And this is very, very important. Don't try to bring in a partner to sell them a product or service. And then vice versa. Don't try to make a client a, a partner in the wrong situation. So a lot of times you find it easier to go one route, even though they should have gone, you know, on the left side of the fork in the road, uh, you put them on the right side. So if you're trying to make partners or push partners into places where they shouldn't be, vice versa, clients into places they shouldn't be, you're going to find that you're wasting a lot of time, energy, resources, and you're not getting the type of results that you're looking for. Understand and be clear about where somebody should fit into your business model and that will help you, like I say, save you time, energy, frustration. A lot of us, when we start our business, we want to qualify as many people. we got this huge bucket. Everybody fits into this bucket. Well, what you realize is that you're trying to qualify too many people when really what we should be doing is disqualifying people. When you disqualify people, it helps you in two ways. It gets rid of the people that don't fit into your personas. And the people that do, it reinforces by giving away some type of a takeaway language, their interest or non-interest in what we're trying to do next. The red card comes out and the red flags come up when you're talking to people on really four things. The budget. When you're talking to somebody about buying a product or service, is this prospect capable of buying this product or service? Well, if they're not, it doesn't matter what job or how great of a job you do on the front side, you're wasting your time. Same thing with authority. Does the person that you are talking to have the adequate authority to sign off on the purchase? Sometimes that's as easy as the spouse making the decisions and they're not there. Um, the need. Does the prospect have a pain that you can solve that's been um, you know, something that's been brought up, been identified, been addressed that you can offer a solution? If there's no need, there's no way you're going to move them forward. Remember the why, the pain point, the motivating factor, and then the timeline. When is this person planning to take action? Some people are never planning to take action. So you need to identify this early on. Look for the red cards, the red flag leading indicators that tell you when to bail on a conversation or a lead. And you want to stay away from these people. These people are going to basically just drain you for time and it's not really something that should have fallen into the right persona when you can identify these people easy uh, early on. The shopper, these people never make buying decisions. They just look and look and look and look without ever making a decision. That's going to be very frustrating for you as a person trying to push them through a pipeline to an end point. The snail, they're just so slow. Take some weeks and weeks and weeks to get anything accomplished. The next thing you know, you've been working with them for six months. 
and you're trying to get them through something that should have taken 72 hours. The hide and seeker, this is the person that never wants to answer the calls. They may answer a random email, or if you got them on a drip campaign, they're opening up emails, they're clicking, but they are never making communication with you. You know, hide and seek's a fun game to play as a kid, not as a professional building a business. The stack deck, this is no matter what you can introduce to them as a solution, they've already got an alternate plan or a reason where they're gonna do something else. And then find the criminal. This is a person that just doesn't fit into what you're trying to do. They're trying to do something that doesn't make sense to you or is unethical, maybe even illegal. You know, all of the things that throw up that, hey, I don't even want to work with this person. I don't need them in a pipeline. I don't need them in an organization as a partner or as a client. Stay away from these people. Identify them early on, and it will help you through the process of what you're trying to do. You're ultimately going to have to pick an approach. You're going to pick personas and you're going to pick language, verbiage, everything that you're trying to do to build your business. We are all unique people. We have different personalities. We have different people that we would approach and feel more comfortable around. Your approach, obviously, you want to define that approach, use it, and then form a best approach out of there. And one of the ways that I've found to form a best approach on handling objections is to handle those preemptively. So the best defense sometimes is just a good offense. So if you know before going into a lot of these calls, probably what the objection is, what needs to be clarified or addressed, and you can handle that before it comes out of their mouth, well, it leads them. And when people, you know, a lot of people want to be led if it's in a good direction. So preemptively handling these objections is a great way to solve the problem really before it even comes up. Remember, preemptive, preventative, preventive, precautionary, protective, it's all pre. So it's happening before the action or the language even comes out from the other side. You're trying to just continually hit the bullseye, right? And if you're hitting the bullseye on partners or um, clients, what you want to do and how you want to preemptively lead conversations, whether it's text, advertising, whether it's oral communication, there's something you've gotten results with yourself. You're using the product or service, great. Nothing better than, you know, um, your own uh, results. A problem you had to figure out for yourself, something that you're already teaching others that's working, something others ask you to help with, and then what can you help people do in a more efficient way, whether that's faster, better, cheaper, et cetera. So this is the lead in. This is what you're trying to hit the bullseye with. And this works for a number of reasons that we've talked about in the past you know, when you're talking about stories of transformation, when you're talking about advertising, telling stories that lead people to an action step versus just handing them information, it works a lot better. So the structure of a conversation or an ad or whatever you're trying to do, you know, what's the hook? What's going to get somebody to even buy you a little bit more time, scroll a little bit more? Well, that's the big, bold promise. And then the story, really, how have you discovered the method? And the one big thing, that's the bird's eye view of really what's happening here. And then you can see secret number one, secret number two, and secret number three, you're going to go ahead and preemptively overcome some of those false beliefs that are typical in the conversations about why the other side thinks they can't achieve that goal. And then at that point, you introduce the offer. Now, the offer obviously is a product or a service from our side but you can't introduce a product or a service. You have to introduce the offer as how do you help people implement what they just learned? So remember, if we're leading with education, we're gonna show people how to implement what they've learned or what they will learn into an easy to follow system. So what is that one big thing? It's that method you've helped to you or that you use to help people reach their goals. The most important thing is the other side, the people that you're talking to or advertising to, whatever it might be, they must believe that your method will work for them. They don't care about everybody else. They care about them. Otherwise, they're not going to buy. They're not going to give you their time, their money, um, their attention. Once people believe that your method will work for them, once again, for them, they will pursue the means to implement that method. So that one big thing is very important. And that leads to the expert secret. So this is going to give you a chance to preemptively overcome objections in conversations, in advertising, whatever it might be. You must remove any objections or roadblocks that prevent people from believing your one big thing. So what false beliefs are typical that other people that you've encountered generally 
think or might think that they can't achieve their goal with the method that you're trying to teach. Once you've removed all objections, your one big thing must be true. And guess what? They're ready to go to the next step. That's where you introduce your offer. Now, it's important. The offer is not a what. It's not a product or a service. The offer is how to implement the information, the system, whatever it is that you're advertising here, how to implement that to get what they want. Remember, guys, this is a windy road if you allow it to be. You've got to make shortcuts. You've got to develop straight paths and pipelines and lanes from A to B. The more confusing you make it for partners and clients, uh, the less they're going to get to that end point. The more you can cut through all of this stuff, objections, and sometimes, like I said, preemptively, the easier it would be for you to carve a pathway out, build a pipeline, start resolving leads. If you've got something that people need, and you're not having to manufacture the demand for that product or service, you're leading with education. All of these things will greatly help you find the success you're looking for. And when you have the things that we do on our side and solving the problems that we're solving, if people use our products and services, you're not going to have somebody come back at a later date and say, hey, this didn't work for me because a lot of what we do, the only way it will not work is if they don't use it. So be confident in what you have to offer and then understand that marketing and what we say, what we advertise, what we send via text, email, uh, it all has a target objective. What are you trying to get them to do? And on the objections, the more that you can handle preemptively, uh, easier it'll be to pave that way. Next week, we're going to go into um, you know a week or two about management. How do you get people working? How do you invest time into people to get a return? All of the things that you're looking for on an organizational basis that are going to create the cash flow asset that pays you passive income and actually gives you an exit strategy from this business, which when you're talking to a lot of other professionals, they do not have exit strategies. That's what's lacking when they built their business. They have no way to leave it with any type of money on the backside.